Hi, Professor Rapetti here again. And today's video is a short one on Socrates. A good amount of what you hear today will be in also in the video called The Apology, The Apology of Plato or Plato's Apology. But this is a preview to give you a sense of Socrates before you actually go into his trial. This is a good amount of what I'm going to say today. Um, this includes some stuff that Socrates says at his trial. All right, so let me get a screen share here so you can see my slides. All right, here we go. Socrates, and that is a sculpture of Socrates. The saying is his most famous statement, the unexamined life is not worth living, which might sound a little elitist, as if a person who doesn't examine their life should commit suicide or their life is meaningless or worthless. Well, you know, it could mean that, but I don't think that's what he meant. I mean, you could look at it another way that a life most worth living is an examined life. I'll just give one or two thoughts about how that might be meaningful without being judgmental or looking down on someone who's not philosophical. But as you hear the rest of what we have to say about Socrates in this video and in the next one, which is about his defense of himself at his trial, you'll get a better sense of what he meant by that and the context in which he famously uttered it, which was at his trial. But Socrates devoted the better part of his life to philosophical inquiry, to reflection, to the search for wisdom and understanding, for meaning, for value, to figure out what the good life is and how ought he to live. How should human beings live? Just like animals, there's nothing wrong with having pleasures of the flesh, so to speak. But if you never enjoy the more meaningful pleasures of the mind, of the soul, of love, rather than just sex, right? You have sex, but you make love, right? Socrates' whole philosophy was about love of the soul, love of meaning, love of purpose, love of wisdom, love of virtue. Right? These are the higher goods in life, the more meaningful ones. I forget where this story comes from, but there's a story, I forget who wrote it, about a guy who goes to heaven and He's really happy, he can do whatever he wants. He starts pursuing all of his interests, you know, golf. And he becomes an excellent golfer. He gets perfect holes in one every single time, right? And then after a while, you know, he's got to find something else to do. And so he, he goes through one hobby after another and learns one language after another. And after a while, it's like he realizes, okay, you know, I just put my mind to something. I devote myself to it. This is heaven. So it's kind of supports me in my efforts. But no matter what interest I pick up after a short while, you know, in eternity, I master it. And then, you know, as I mentioned in another lecture, there's that thin line between boredom and anxiety. If you challenge too much, your skills don't meet the demands, you have anxiety. If you're not challenged enough, you become bored, right? So keeping that balance between boredom and anxiety, well, you know, you could do that with only so many things, chess playing, this, that, martial arts, you know, in heaven, I would imagine, you can do this stuff for, you know, a thousand years. And then maybe after 10,000 years, there's just nothing left for you to master, right? So whatever, a long period of time goes by and the guy goes up to St. Peter, you know, the guy in charge of the pearly gates and people who come in and go out. 
And he says, yeah, yeah no, excuse me, but um, yeah, what's going on here? And Peter says, is there a problem? This is heaven, you know, get to do whatever you want. He goes, yeah, I know, but no matter what I do, I just get really good at it after a while. And then, you know, there's no challenge left. And I'm like, I think I've done about just about everything. And even if there was a, a few more things or even just as many things as I've already done, it's like after a while you realize, okay, you rise up to the challenge, you meet the challenge, and then there's no more challenge. You know, it's like after a while, how many, each one of them is like a donut. After a while, you know, if all you eat is donuts, you know, you, you lose your taste for donuts. Like, I think I'm done. And St. Peter says to him, ah, oh, very good. Now you're ready to die. Okay, so that's an interesting little wisdom story. Um, I'm not sure what the takeaway is in terms of the unexamined life is not worth living, but I think Socrates might never tire of heaven because Socrates is interested in more than learning karate and being good at tennis and beating people in chess and tasting delicious foods and hearing good music. Right, he's into the more meaningful things like having meaningful relationships with people, appreciating value, beauty, love. If you're in those kinds of relationships with yourself and with others who are close to you, who you've built deep bonds with, that's a different kind of meaning in life. So for a philosopher, the examined life is most worth living. It's not that the unexamined life isn't really worth living. Socrates put it in strong terms for a reason that'll become clear shortly. But that's my intro to that statement, right? You might want to say the examined life, the one you reflect on and contemplate on and, and try to figure out what gives deeper lasting more meaningful joy and satisfaction and fulfillment than just, you know, that pizza was delicious or that wine was delicious or that cigarette was delicious or that sex was great, whatever it is, right? If you find something that's more meaningful, like wisdom, wisdom tells you what's more meaningful, what matters more, what matters less, what's worth valuing, right? So the pursuit of wisdom for Socrates requires examining and reflecting on and contemplating on everything that matters and differentiating between what matters and what doesn't matter, what you can control, what you can't control, how you ought to live, what you should pursue, what you shouldn't pursue. That's the examined life. Failing to live an examined life as a human being is almost like being a child who never grows up, right? And there's nothing wrong with being a child. But if your body chronologically matures, but you never stop just being enthralled with the equivalent of candy and games, right? Maybe you never grow up. And so like there's a whole other dimension of life that you never really even experience, right? So now as an adult, maybe you, you're not just about candy and games, although you're about better kinds of food experiences and maybe a little more sophisticated video games or whatever, but you could still be only about the equivalent of candy and games if you lack the examined life, which reveals deeper value and deeper meaning and transforms you in the process in the same way that a child, once they become a true adult, they've moved beyond the candy and games, right? Is a different kind of person, same history, same memories, but this person is kind of metaphysically transformed when the child is no longer a child, but is now an adult. It's almost like two different people, like a caterpillar and a butterfly. Yet many adults never inquire or examine about the more deeper philosophical meaning and purpose of life. So in a sense, they will not awaken or become enlightened or philosophically mature. They will be equivalent to adult-sized children from a philosophical perspective. That's what Socrates is talking about as far as I can tell. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. 
Okay, so we just finished talking about the sophists, right? So um, what do I want to say? A little bit of a recap about the sophists. And um, this little cartoon, hopefully will do it for you, right? And I think this cartoon might have also been in my sophist slide at the end. I don't remember, but yeah, I think it was. So it's this is a recap. Consider this part of the review, right? You've got two people who disagree, George and Mary. One says P is true, where P represents some proposition. It looks like a P and an F, though. It's a funny looking little symbol. And the other one says it's not. And the sophist says, well, P is true for George, but not true for Mary. It's both true and false. And Socrates is like, no, 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 wait a second. It can't be both. It's got to be one or the other. Even if we don't know which one it is, the statement and its opposite can't both be true at the same time in the same way. So Socrates is rejecting this doctrine, if you recall, called relativism. And he's also rejecting the doctrine of subjectivism. Right? Truth is relative to the individual or to the culture. Subjectivism is the claim that, perhaps a little more strongly, that there's no such thing as objective reality or objective truth. Sophists believe that is sort of relativism and subjectivism and a variety of other nihilistic views. Meaning doesn't exist and you can't communicate it if it did and all kinds of things like that. Right? Socrates is dead against that. He argued with the um, sophists and with the nature philosophers, right? But the sophists kind of, there maybe there were more of them and they, they were more challenged. Like the nature philosophers didn't bother Socrates because they believed in an objective reality. So let me go back, right? They believe that either P is true or false, right? So he just disagreed with them if they claim, well, P is true. And then maybe another nature philosopher said, no, it's not air, it's fire. And no, it's not fire. Okay, they disagree. But I think they would all agree that it's got to be one or the other or something else. There's got to be a fact to the matter, a way that reality actually is. So even though Socrates argued with the nature philosophers, he didn't oppose them. He just thought they're focusing on something that's not as important as what kind of beings are we? What kind of life should we live? What really matters, right? Search for wisdom, not just science, some scientific understanding. Okay, so let's compare, again, sophistry versus reason. And Socrates is kind of like the Mr. Miyagi of reason, you might want to say, from the Karate Kid, right? Sophistry is intentional, irrational persuasion, right? Knowing that you're using irrational elements to persuade somebody such as rhetoric which is you know fancy verbiage poetic whatever you know the right kind of imagery you know good and bad people use rhetoric like adolf hitler and martin luther king right adolf hitler would stir up hatred by you know certain kinds of references to purity of our race and the impurity of you know the jews and this and that right to rile up his german followers and you know, Martin Luther King appealed to all of our common moral sentiments, mountains of hope and valleys of despair and our children and color of our skin is irrelevant. And, you know, what's the content of our character is what matters, right? I mean, they're both reasoning. One of them is using good reasoning, Martin Luther King. The other one's using bad reasoning or false premises, like racist premises, right? But that's rhetoric, right? The Crafty use of language to manipulate people, their emotions, uh, by using your own emotions and your charisma, psychological tricks. Um, what a famous contemporary philosopher who was one of my dissertation examiners, Harry Frankfurt, wrote a book called On Bullshit, which is, you know, when you're kind of just telling stories to impress people and win them over in some way, whether it's at the bar or a politician or, you know, you no longer care about the truth. 
right? Telling stories. You're telling people what they want to hear, right? Sophistry and the sophists who engaged in it, right? They're in a competitive context, right? And for them, truth is irrelevant. Just winning matters. Now, on the right side, we've got reason. So as opposed to irrational persuasion, we've got rational persuasion. Irrational persuasion is by reference to rhetoric, emotions, charisma, psychology, use of bullshitting, right? Whereas reason uses rational persuasion by reference to facts, truth, logic, logical thinking, and honesty, you know, truthful, honest claims, not bullshitting, being honest, being frank being truthful, being simple. And unlike the competitive environment that the politicians are in and lawyers are in and salesmen are in and advertisers are in, right? They're all in a competitive context to try to get your vote or win the case or get you to buy their product or whatever it is, right? Reason functions cooperatively. I'm not in competition with you if you and I and everybody else in this class or wherever, are trying to figure out what should we believe? What argument makes the most sense? What are the real facts in this case? What are the relevant facts, right? Are those facts relevant, right? So 30 minds are better than one if they're cooperating to find the truth, like a, a team of doctors trying to solve a case or a team of scientists trying to figure something out or even a team of auto mechanics trying to figure out what's wrong with that engine, right? So science, technology, philosophy, the pursuit of knowledge is a cooperative thing, even if people compete within it in a certain way, like different people who try to bring the same kind of product to market at the same time, entrepreneurs, you know, uh, even scientists who want to win the grant but, or, or win a Nobel Prize or whatever it is, you know. There's that kind of competition, but it's still honest cooperation, honest, cooperative, and so on, in principle, in theory, at least anyway, particularly, maybe not, you know, there are degrees of cooperative and competitive mixtures, the further away you get from the pure philosophical pursuit of wisdom. But the pursuit of wisdom is a purely cooperative, like, I don't care, when I meet some philosopher or watch a podcast or read a book by some philosopher who's more brilliant than I am and who says so many of the things that I was thinking, but I couldn't articulate, I'm freaking thrilled, okay? I'm like, what? That's what I was trying to figure out how to say. Boy, that guy, I wish it was me, but ooh, that was great, you know? I'll applaud when somebody performs better than me or beats me in a karate match or whatever it is, right? Like, hey, you know, that's friendly co competition, right? When you're training in a dojo, which I've done for many years, right, you want to win the match, but you're also cooperating with your sparring partners. They're your friends. You don't really want to hurt them. You just want to get the points. You want to win. But if they win, you know, good for them, right? Don't be a sore sport, right? That's the attitude in theory and philosophy anyway. Okay. So sophistry um, was what Socrates was battling, and it was kind of taking over. And it's taking over in our culture today. So be more like Socrates. The world needs more Socrates, folks. Okay. So that was the sophist. What about, and you know, I was a little unfair. I'll go back a page. I wrote sophistry rather than the sophist versus Socrates, right? So soph the sophists do represent sophistry because they don't believe in truth. They just believe in propaganda. OK, so I don't think it's that unfair, but, you know, I'm just kind of rehearsing what the. Um, who the people were in Socrates day, two waves of philosophers right before him, physis, the nature philosophers and nomos. Right. But I did it in reverse order because we just finished talking about the sophists in the last video. But recall, what's the difference between nature philosophy and the Socratic approach? Well, nature philosophy was more about speculation, hypotheses about creation, about physics, about matter, what's the world made out of, and all that presented as knowledge, right? Um, but none of those people 
none of the nature philosophers acknowledged or admitted that their claims were really inconclusive, right? They didn't say, you know, maybe the world is made out of water. They said, no, no, they said, I figured it out. The world is made out of water, right? No, I figured it out. The world is made out of fire, right? They spoke conclusively or assertively or confidently. They uttered claims as if those claims were true, as if they knew that they were true. That's not Socrates' approach, right? He was more hesitant. He, did, he was hesitant to accept the claims of the nature philosophers. They just didn't strike him as plausible enough. Like the evidence for their claims was weak, right? So the Socratic approach, as opposed to the nature philosophy approach, is the rational examination of everything, ideas, language, meaning. Just paying attention to the words we use in our concepts and our claims, Socrates would find problems with them. What do you mean by that claim? How do you know it's true? Those are like maybe the, the two main things, Socrates. Like, what exactly do you mean by that? And how do you know it's true? Because, the, oh, well, what do you mean by that? Oh, well, how do you know that that's true? Right? So Socrates' logical analysis would reveal problems and limitations of the beliefs of the nature philosophers. And he thought that making knowledge claims without first acquiring wisdom is a mistake. It's futile. Like, we don't know enough to answer physics questions. We just don't. Right. So let's pay attention. Let's try and figure out stuff that we we can like. How should our minds work? How should we figure out what counts as knowledge? How, wh what's the first thing we should acquire? Some wisdom. Philosophical wisdom. If we have that, then we could approach other things like what kind of being is a man? What's the purpose of a human life? What matters more in a human life? How should we live, right? Answer those questions first and then worry about the other things. Well, that was Socrates' attitude. And he admitted that he didn't know. Like, it's like, you know, if you got an education, but you were paying attention when you got the education and you were like Socrates, when you went through grammar school, you might've been saying, okay, yeah, I could see in arithmetic how it works, but I got some questions about numbers like are they real or are they just the way we talk about things or right it's like you hear about history well how could they know what happened a thousand years ago exactly they speak as if these are facts but do we really know that that's exactly what happened uh, you know even nowadays the news is flaky how do we know you know right so if you ask those kinds of questions as you were getting your education in grammar school and in high school and I hope you keep asking them as you're in college, when your knowledgeable, erudite, authoritative professors tell you this is a fact, this theory has been established and this and that and this and that and blah, 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 blah. Be like Socrates. Be like the way that you were, that little voice in you when you were a kid who was like, I'm not so sure I believe that, right? Water that, that's your philosophical spirit. That's your inner philosopher, right? That's your little Socrates in you, right? That's the part of you that believes in your doubts. So, yeah, I'm not so sure I believe that. You've been kind of manipulated by society to bury that, right? And society has, through osmosis, you know, we watch how other people walk and we walk the way they do. You know, when I grew up in the housing projects in Astoria, Queens, all the cool kids walked a certain way. They had a certain rhythm to their walk, right? They're like, you know, they all did that, right? That was just, you know, what, what they, it's not genetic. They learned it by monkey see, monkey do, you know, osmosis, you know, we try to fit in. We want to be like everybody else, right? And what? What does that have to do with Socrates? Well, most people learn not to admit that they don't know things. We want to act like we know things that we don't know. 
right? You get on the elevator and somebody gets on on the next floor and they say to you, wow, that was some game last night, huh? Well, wow, they really whooped their butts, didn't they? And you don't even know what game they're talking about, right? And you just go like, <laughs> whatever, yeah, yeah, right? Because you're afraid, you're embarrassed to say, oh, what, what game was that? I don't really follow sports or whatever that sport was on last night. I don't follow it, right? So unlike that, Socrates was brutally honest and unafraid to admit that he didn't know what he didn't know or that those claims aren't really well established, right? All right, moving right along. Okay. Now, here is an interesting story that we're definitely going to hear more about in the next video about the Oracle of Delphi. Now, Delphi is a city and a city state in ancient Greece with a temple of Apollo, which is still there, remnants of it, ruins of it, rather. And an oracle like the oracle in the Matrix or the oracles, those kind of witches who foretold the future in the movie 300, which was about the Greeks battling, fighting, battling the Persians in the Peloponnesian War, I believe, or one of those wars. Um, you know, they're like witches, you know, they're mystics, they go into trances and they're mediums for spirits or gods, right? So in Delphi it was the temple of the god Apollo, right? And there was an oracle there and she was a woman, like a high priestess, kind of witchy looking sorcerer type of woman from Pythia. So she was called the Pythian. We don't know her name. I don't think we know her name. But people came from all over the ancient world, from all over the Middle East, from all over the Greek world. She was kind of like one of the wonders, like the seven wonders, you know, not exactly on the list, maybe number eight. But generals, all kinds of people would go and consult the oracle. And she'd be there in the temple, standing over a certain spot with two attendants, two men. She'd go into a trance. Her voice would change. Her body posture would change. And she was believed, because this was the temple of the god Apollo, to be a medium channeling the god Apollo. Right? like Sigourney Weaver in the movie Ghostbusters with, what was it, Zool or something? Gozor, I don't know, one of those things, right? Or Whoopi Goldberg, the medium in the movie Ghost, with Patrick Swayze, when that guy, the ghost guy, jumps into her body during the seance, all right? Okay, so let me change the page here. Yeah, there's Socrates, and there's the god Apollo above him. So the god Apollo speaks through the oracle, right? The oracle is a medium for the god. That's why people go there. They believe that Apollo is speaking. And a god of wisdom is Apollo. He's also the sun god, right? Like Zeus is the sky god, and Poseidon is the ocean god, and Gaia is the earth god. The word geology comes from that, right? He's the sun god, the god of light. And light is illumination, it's wisdom, it's knowledge, it's intelligence, it's the arts, all that sort of stuff, right? The God of wisdom, the philosopher's God, right? So somebody goes to the oracle and asks a question, but the oracle was always very vague, like Yoda, who would speak backwards, right? You know, oh, before I get to that, one example would be something like a general comes right? And they're about to have a battle, huge battle, like say between, you know, the Spartans and the Athenians or whatever, or the Persians and the Spartans or whatever it is, and says, you know, we're on the verge of war. We're going into battle tomorrow. What's the outcome going to be? And the oracle goes into a trance and says something vague, like tomorrow a mighty army will fall. Right, and then comes out of the trance, and um, 
the interpreters, the two interpreters translate it because the oracle doesn't even remember what she said because it wasn't her. All right. So a friend of Socrates named Chiron goes and asks the oracle. The oracle was always vague, right? Always vague, right? That's like if you go to an astrologer or a palm reader or a tarot card reader, or you go for any one of these kinds of psychic readings, you know, the psychic reader is going to ask you questions and give you vague answers. I sense that there's a romance issue in your life. It, yeah? Right? And then they read your response. Yeah, I knew it. You know, this kind of thing. Um, so the more vague you are, the more likely people will believe that you're really an oracle or a psychic or whatever it is. Right? So in this case, a very specific question. Is anyone wiser than Socrates? And unlike the oracle's usual behavior, right, the answer is very specific. No, no man is wiser than Socrates. All right. So that's pretty interesting. Like, whoa, what's that about? Why was the oracle so quick and so decisive when the oracle is almost, oh, you didn't even need an interpreter for that. Everybody else always needed the two interpreters to try to put a spin on it that, you know, satisfied the seeker, right? And everybody believed this oracle because they believed in the god Apollo, right? I wonder if there was, you know, a god Apollo. Maybe there was. <sighs> you never know. In any event, this is the opposite of vague. It's extremely precise, and it's important to point that out. Okay. This leads to a kind of paradox for Socrates. Now remember what a paradox is. A paradox is when you have two or more beliefs, both or all of which you think are true, and yet you realize that they can't all be true. Now you've got a paradox. You have to maybe give one up or try to find a solution to the paradox by maybe adding another belief or some modification somewhere that explains away the paradox, right? Like jumbo shrimp does not really just mean big, small, which reminds me, Biggie Smalls, may he rest in peace. It's kind of like jumbo shrimp, his name, right? But he's not a paradox. Okay, getting back to all humor aside, what's the paradox here? Okay, here it is. Socrates refuses to accept the compliment before I even tell you what the, the, yeah, before we even get into the paradox, just think about this. If the God of wisdom in the religion that you and your entire society believed in was believed to speak through this one voice, right? That's like the Pope or Jesus speaking for God, right? I am the son of God. What comes out of my mouth is out of my father's mouth or something like that, right? And forgive me for being a little irreverent, but I'm making an analogy. And like God said through the prophet, Rick Rapetti is the wisest man, or no man is wiser than Rick Rapetti. I must confess, I'd probably be like, yeah, told y'all. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm the philosopher, dude. I'm the mega, I'm the, I'm the Mac Daddy of philosophical wisdom. Philosophical wisdom, yeah, that's what it's like. <laughs> I'm just kidding around to make the point that if, if, if God through his prophet said you, 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 you the student, you, you are the coolest human being in the universe, right? You'd be like, yes, I knew it, right? <laughs> so, okay, Socrates is like, nah, eh, I, don't, I don't have any wisdom. I hardly know anything. All those nature philosophers, think they know all kinds of things that I don't really believe are true. Uh, I don't have that knowledge. And the sophists claim that it's all kind of meaningless. And I really don't believe that. You know, and no matter who he talks to, he wasn't walking away, showing his own knowledge. He was kind of just walking away. I haven't found knowledge yet. I don't know if I'm ever going to find any knowledge or wisdom. Right. So this is a tremendous mark 
of Socrates' integrity, what we call intellectual integrity and humility, and his virtuous character, right? Like, he didn't let it go to his head. He didn't develop the big ego. He didn't say, yeah, that's right. I'm the wise man. <laughs> Forgive me for my sense of humor. But um, that's important to notice. All right, so on to the paradox now. Okay, what, what's the contradiction? Right, it's not, remember the difference between paradox and contradiction. Do you remember it? Straight up contradictions, you're not inclined to believe both components of them. Like everything that is entirely black is entirely white, right? Or what is absolutely infinite is totally minuscule and finite, right? Um, those, nobody's inclined to believe straightforward contradictions like, Today is today, and today is not today. You know, or I am not here now speaking, right? Anything that's obviously contradictory, we're not inclined. But there are some contradictory elements that we're still inclined to believe both things, even though we realize hmm, they can't both be true. That's a paradox, okay? So what's the paradox here? Why am I saying Socrates has a paradox? because he really does believe in the gods, particularly the God of wisdom, right? The God of wisdom, Apollo is like the philosopher's God, that's number one, but there were whole cults, philosophical and mystical cults revolving around Apollo, right? Cults of Apollo, mystery cults, Gnostic cults, G-N-O-S-T-I-C, the Gnostics believed that you could have a kind of higher knowledge directly and immediately, some kind of divine knowledge or mystical knowledge or transcendent knowledge or knowledge of the gods, like what, what happens with the oracle, right? And Apollo was believed to be the god in charge of that sort of thing, right? There were people who prayed to, to uh, Apollo and had all kinds of rituals to try to invoke Apollo and that sort of thing, right? So Socrates believes in the god, not just Apollo, he believes in the gods. That's his religion, right? Just because Socrates questions asks questions about the gods doesn't mean that he doesn't believe in them, right? There are many reasons when you look at the rest of Socrates' life for believing that he believed in the gods. He just didn't believe all the stories about the gods. He thought some of them were like in the telephone game, how things get exaggerated and changed over time, right? Or that some of them didn't make sense. What he believed about the gods is that they had to be morally upright. And some of the stories depict them as abominable, just like human beings, right? The standard conception of Greek gods is that they're kind of like immortal humans, right? They're not morally perfect. They just don't die. That's two features that they have. One, they're immortal. And two, each one of them has a unique power, right? They're kind of like immortal X-Men or something like that, right? And Socrates thought, no, that's not good enough. If it's a god, it has to be morally exemplar, morally exemplary. It has to be really noble. It can't be the way that these soap opera stories about the gods, right? In any event, that was Socrates' criticisms of the belief system, but he still believed in the gods. Okay, so that's number one. Premise one, Socrates, the gods can't lie. Premise two, the, the key god, the chief god of wisdom, the philosopher's god, says no man is wiser than Socrates. Okay, so if... Socrates believes the gods can't lie, and the god said no man is wiser than Socrates. What's the problem? Socrates' belief that he's not wise at all, right? That is a problem, right? I hope you see it. Look at it for a moment without looking at me. That's why I shut off my screen. If the gods can't lie, and they say no man is wiser than Socrates, that implies that Socrates is the wisest man. So one and two together imply that three is false. Socrates thinks, I'm not wise at all. But the gods can't be wrong, and the gods say, I'm the wisest man. That means three must be false. Well, how could three be false if I don't even know that I have wisdom? How could I have wisdom that I don't even know about? That's the puzzle. That's Socrates' paradox. And that's what he has to spend the rest of his life 
trying to figure out. Okay. All right. Let me try to get my camera back on, but it's not helping me. All right. Oh, there you go. Right. One and two contradict three, but all three seem true. Sorry about the delay. I was having difficulty trying to find my, um, my cursor so that I could turn my camera back on. There you go. All right, I'm back. Okay, so Socrates' mission in life is to try to figure out how could three be false? Because one and two entail that three is false. Let me go back up, right? If the gods can't lie and they're real, and one of the gods says, Socrates is the wisest man, but Socrates, number three, believes, I, I'm not the wisest man. I don't have any wisdom at all. If the gods can't lie and they know what they're talking about, then three must be false. So I got to figure out how it could possibly be true that I am not only not wise, but that I am wise and that I'm the wisest man. It's like the opposite of three. All right. So that's the puzzle. That becomes Socrates. He was already philosophical. He was already arguing with the nature philosophers and the sophists and anybody else that was just his nature, how can I find out if or how all three can be true? He believed one and two. He also believed three, but he knows one and two contradict three. So how could they all be true? I don't get it. So strategy he adopts, he was already examining and interrogating people who claim to have knowledge, the nature philosophers, the sophists, right? You know, I'll tell you a secret, kid. There are no secrets. Nothing matters. Nothing's true, right? Those are people who are making claims as if they know the ultimate nature of reality, right? They're claiming to have wisdom. Socrates doesn't believe them. He doesn't believe the nature philosophers. Who else might have knowledge, right? The sophists don't seem to have it. The nature philosophers don't seem to have it. I've got to go around and inter interrogate other people, whoever might be wise, to see what whether it, maybe I can, if I find people who are wise, I can figure out what wisdom is, and then maybe I can see that I have some of that wisdom or whatever. That's, that's the next step. All right. Once again, nature philosophers, they just speculate. They're generating theories. You know, they see some data and they form a hypothesis. Not enough. Right? Later, science is almost enough, but it's always open to revision. That doesn't seem to be knowledge, much less wisdom. The sophist sounds like knowledge. They speak as if they have knowledge, but it's more like propaganda. It's not the truth. And Socrates obviously has this assumption that if you know something, it must be true. There must be a truth and a reality for you to know it. Right? He disagrees with the sophists that way. They say there's no reality, so you can't know anything. Right? But they speak as if they know that. Right? And they kind of contradict themselves. Okay, so now he says, okay, in our culture, remember, in Greek religion, polytheism, the many gods, the prophets of that religion are the poets, Homer, Hesiod, and any poet possessed by the muses, the daughters of Zeus, or like angels who come in and speak through you. It's like speaking in tongues, angelic speak. That's poetry. Music from the muses. They amuse you. You become enchanted, right? Right? Okay. He interrogates them. They seem wise. Certainly they're fountains of wisdom. Right? But when he would try to reason with him, with them, which was his method of cross-examination questioning and then examining the answers and then questioning those and making sure those are consistent with the other things that the speaker said and making sure they clarify what they mean. And then like in those attempts with anybody, whether it's nature philosophers, sophists, or the poets, their claims fall apart. Well, when it came to the poets, they could produce what sounded like wisdom, right? But they couldn't explain why it was wisdom or what the morals of the story were, or how they knew, or how anyone could know that those things were true, right? So he thought they have some kind of gift 
but they don't have wisdom. They are funnels for wisdom, but they don't even know what wisdom is. Oh, and I, I, I lop together in with the sophists, by the way, let me go back up here, politicians, as you'll see when we do the apology in the next video, right? Because the politicians were all sophists, right? And you think about politicians today. They talk the talk. They're very persuasive. It's all about hope and progress. And we can, and we will, and I know, and we're gonna, and we all matter, and this and that and the other thing. And yeah, they sound really good, right? But it's all propaganda. I'll say more about these three categories, the politicians slash sophists, the poets, and the craftsmen when we do the apology, because this, this discussion comes right out of the apology, but this is just a little bit of a preview. He thought, okay, wait a second. You know, Socrates himself was a craftsman. Uh, he, was a he was a great warrior when he was in the military service, but he spent most of his life as a, a kind of construction worker, a stonemason, carving granite and things like that, marble and whatnot, in the quarry right? Hard physical labor, right? And so he knew shipbuilders and shoemakers and stone cutters, and they all have knowledge. They have real skills. They have what some philosophers nowadays would call know-how, right? Technical knowledge, knowledge how to do things, as opposed to knowledge that this proposition is true or that historical statement is false, right? There's this kind of propositional knowledge, and there's know-how knowledge, knowing how to speak French, how to make pizza pie, how to dance, whatever, how to ride a bike. Those are different skills. They're overlapping in certain ways. And there's also a third category of knowledge that Socrates didn't really discuss, but some of the other philosophers do, which is simply knowing by acquaintance. I know what the color purple looks like because I've seen it. I know what an orange tastes like because I've tasted it. I know what a rose smells like because I've smelled it. I know what Rapetti looks like because I've seen him, right? I can recognize him. Uh, modern epistemologists, those who are theorists about the nature of knowledge, epistemology, the study of knowledge, call that knowledge by acquaintance. I'm acquainted with it. I've had direct perceptual encounter with it. It's kind of contact knowledge, right? But then knowledge that something is true, that two plus two is four, or that Marcus Aurelius was an emperor, one of the greatest emperors in the Roman Empire, knowing that Columbus sailed to the Americas in 1492, right? Though, and knowing that blank, whatever fills in the blank is a claim or a proposition, right? That's propositional knowledge, right? Well, the poets, have a skill, it's a kind of know-how, how to produce rhythmical language that's meaningful, right? but they don't understand it. The sophists and politicians know how to produce persuasive rhetoric, right? but they don't really know the truth of the things that they say or the falsity thereof. The craftsmen know how to do all sorts of things. They have the most knowledge because they, there are things that they actually know, right? The poets kind of do, they, they just, or funnels for poetic wisdom or something like that. But the craftsmen, they have them. Socrates was most impressed with them, and maybe because he was a, like a construction worker or a craftsman himself. Problem with them is they couldn't, they could not distinguish their knowledge from mere opinion. So they have knowledge, and then they utter their opinions as if they were truths, just like the sophists would utter things that they didn't believe, or just like the nature philosophers would utter things that they didn't really know to be true, but as spoken as if they did know. So if you can't differentiate between what you know and what you don't know, then what you do know is kind of useless. Like if I go to you and you're an expert on anything, right? And but you're equally convinced about things that you're not an expert about, then that kind of undermines your expertise, even about what you're an expert about. If you can't differentiate between these are the things that you know, and these are the things that you don't know, but you treat them both as if you know them all, then your claim to know anything is jeopardized and undermined thereby, right? This is a problem. 
So Socrates says, well, you know, well, here's one thing that I know. I know that I don't know anything that they claim to know. They think that they know those things, but they don't. I know that I don't know those things, and I don't know them. Right? So at least that's something that I have that they don't have. Light bulb went off at one point for Socrates. Conclusion. All three are true. How can all three be true? If wisdom is knowing, you do not know what you don't know. Or if wisdom is knowing the difference between what you know and what you don't know. Or if wisdom is awareness of your own ignorance, then I have wisdom. And it makes sense for me to have claimed that I don't have wisdom. Because I didn't realize that I had it. Everyone else thinks they know what they don't know. They're ignorant, but they think that they're knowledgeable. I'm ignorant, but I know I'm ignorant. That's the only difference that I could find between them. They believe all the things that they say. I don't. They think they're knowledgeable. I don't. I don't think I'm knowledgeable. If knowing that you are ignorant is wisdom, then I am the wisest man because I'm the only one that I've ever met who's willing to admit to himself or to anyone else, I really don't know if that's true. Eh, I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> right? That was Socrates' main skill. Well, two of them. One was asking questions, but the, I think the thing that drove the questions was his search for wisdom and his honesty about, oh, I'm not satisfied with that yet. What about this? What about that? How do you know that? What do you mean by that? Did you use that word one way in this sentence, but you used it another way earlier. Which of the two things do you mean? Well, if you mean different things, then why use the same word? Because if you really, if you, if you identified them differently, then kind of contradicting yourself, you know, this kind of thing. So Socrates was honest to himself and to others that he did not know things that everybody else claimed to know. It's like that story about the emperor's new robe, right? And Socrates is like the kid who says, the emperor has no robe. I hope you know the story. If you don't, look it up. The emperor's new clothes or the emperor's new robe, right? Socrates is that kid, only he's an adult, right? Because only I am aware of the extent of my own ignorance. Now, let me end the screen share. So you can see my pretty face again. I'm, get, you're, I'm sure you're going to get tired of that already. Like the guy in heaven, you know, you get tired of things after a while. If you learn nothing else from this course, learn this. We all have massive amounts of ignorance. Just even the simplest ignorance of facts. There's just so many facts that we don't know. And especially in this age of fake news, we've got experts on both sides of every issue, published experts, and like the authorities on both sides of every debate claim that the alleged authorities on the other side aren't really good authorities. So it's almost impossible for somebody who's not an expert themselves to figure out what the valid claims are about COVID, masking, social distancing, this vaccine, that vaccine, these unapproved treatment measures, and so on, right? Just that one issue, just, just pick that. It's so politically charged that people think that, well, if I'm a Democrat, then I have to believe everything that Fauci said. Fauci or Fauci? I forget. Fauci. Maybe it's Fauci. See, I don't know. I just don't know. So that's the point, right? And then like, think about climate change, right? Oh, all the experts say. But really, if you dig into it, then you know what? There are experts on both sides and they say different things. It's like that with, I'm not saying, I'm not saying what the sophists say, that there's no truth. What I'm saying is that there's so much propaganda on both sides of every issue today 
that it's almost impossible for the average person to do what made sense to do, or we at least thought it made sense to do, maybe 50 years ago. Well, that's before your time, but in my lifetime, right? We believe journalists, we believe scientists. It turned out many of them were biased and wrong, but that doesn't mean that we gave up on truth, right? But nowadays we're in what people call a post-truth age, right? So like, you've got to rely on your own Socratic ability to think for yourself, question everybody and everything, and don't let anybody intimidate you into thinking, you don't believe that? You must be one of those people on the other side, those silly people or those, those communists or those fascists or whatever, like, but like the conservatives call the left wing progressive people, communists and socialists, right? And the people on the left call anybody who's conservative or more traditional members of the alt-right or, you know, whatever, fascists and, you know, this kind of KKK and all that, both sides. If you're, uh, if you're on the political spectrum at all and you're not on completely on one side or the other side, both sides will criticize you if you're anywhere near the middle. If you're not on the far left, everybody on the left, everybody on the left who's not on the far left is criticized by the people on the far left and by everybody on the right and vice versa for the people on the right who aren't on the far right, you know, it's a crazy world out there, right? So what, what would be most wonderful would be for people to stop being afraid to say, yeah, you know, I, I've heard those arguments for abortion or against abortion or for masking, against masking. You know, it's like I, I, I myself recently read that studies show that being vaccinated doesn't reduce your susceptibility to catching COVID whatsoever. And it doesn't reduce your contagiousness. Now, if that's the case, what's the point of your social distancing? Well, maybe that'll help you avoid catching it. Right. But apparently, you know, unless you're a hermit, we don't know. It's transmitted in the air. You know, there's all these every three weeks, there's a new theory about it. But the point is, it's hard to keep up with the science, the, the alleged science to go with the science. You know, people on the left say that the people on the right are science deniers when it comes to climate change. Right. And people on the right say that people on the left are science deniers when it comes to biology with things like transgenderism, for example, right? Or abortion, right? That that's a human being. It's viable. It could live outside the womb, whatever. So, you know, both sides accuse the other side of being science deniers, but they're both very selective about what science matters to them, right? There's this thing called confirmation bias that you need to learn. Now I'm going off and I'm kind of preaching right now about like, why the world needs you to be Socrates nowadays, right? Confirmation bias. You experience it, you suffer from it, so do I. It goes something like this. We all have biases. Any belief that you already believe is something that you're inclined to continue to believe. And you have a natural disposition to find other things that support your belief and to notice them. They become salient for you. Like salient is something that's a glow, right? Like if you're hungry and you're walking down the street and you smell food, you'll notice that, right? Um, salience is something that's kind of grabs your attention more readily than other things, right? Sticks out for you, right? So um, if you have a bias in favor of a belief, a value, an opinion, whatever it is, right? For whatever reasons, right? We tend to note, even to notice more the things that support it and to kind of put blinders on and ignore the things that undermine it or threaten it. You might notice this if you're scrolling through your news feed and your social media thing and you see something that validates a belief of yours, you're more likely to read it. If you see something that's likely to be at what the opposite of those other people at the other end of the spectrum believe, you're just like libel, it's just bypass it, not even read it, right? Because it's bad news, it's from a bad source and those, those lunatics and Right. And so 
and, and then if you are forced to read it or something, you'll criticize it, you'll find the flaws in it. But when it comes to the things that support your view, you kind of overlook the flaws, you don't notice them as much, right? We're very selective in the way that we reason and reinforce our own beliefs. We wind up associating with people who think like us. We wind up unfriending people who argue with us strongly about those things about which we disagree. And like, you know, that's it. I had enough of those lunatics. I'm going to unfriend them all. Bam, I just lost 200 friends in Facebook or something like that, right? But here's what happens. The more that that happens, it becomes like a vicious cycle so that over time, all you have around you is people who agree with you. And you're in what is now called an echo chamber. And everybody in your echo chamber thinks just like you do. And so whenever you say anything, they'll go, yeah, yeah, right? And you and them have the same memes and you all laugh at each other. You put likes and this and that, and you all criticize the same thing the same way. And uh, we're all just right. We're all right all the time. And those other people, they're all nuts all the time. You see where that's going? We need a lot more Socrates on both sides, okay? Because we're in a divided nation, in a divided world. It's not about what side you're on. Be on the side of truth, right? What do I say? This is what, yeah, political correctness, right? It's much more important to be correct than to be politically correct. And political correctness is relative to the group that you're in. If you're a conservative and all your friends are conservatives, then saying conservative things is politically correct in your circles. But if you're um, a lefty, and you're amongst all the lefties, and you say something that it might be, you know, you say he a lot when you're talking, or men, instead of saying humans or whatever, right? You're not using the proper gender language, right? And that might be seen as politically incorrect because of the, the social context that you're in, right? Now, I'm not saying to be politically insensitive or to be interpersonally or sociologically insensitive. What I'm saying is don't be concerned about what other people think so much. Of course, what other people think matters. But what matters is the truth. What matters is being correct, not being politically correct. Being politically correct just means being a conformist with the group that you identify with. One way to tease those two things apart is to think of shame versus guilt. If you do something that you know is wrong, whether anybody else knows about it, you'll feel guilt. You'll feel regret that you did it. You might feel shame if your group finds out that you said something that they didn't like, right? That's interpersonal. That's a group judgment of you. Shame is what, when other people know that you did something that you know that they will dislike, you have shame. You've been publicly shamed, right? Like, say you wet your pants or something like that, you'll have shame. But really, this there's nothing immoral about you. If it happened, you know, whatever happened for whatever reason, you know, you had a little moment there and you laughed too hard or whatever, whatever it is. I don't mean to be silly, but there's nothing to feel guilty, right? Guilt is about when you've done something that you could have avoided that was immoral, let's just say. Right? Shame has to do with other people's. I mean, we're too worried about shame and about fitting in and conformity, right? There's too, way too much conformity. Socrates was a nonconformist. And, you know, so it's natural for you to have that fear because he got killed for being a nonconformist, right? But yeah, I know I'm preaching, but I'm talking about Socrates, one of my greatest philosophical heroes. And I'll cut this short in a moment, but when we get to his trial, we're going to go, I wanted you to have a little intro to him, and then you'll have his his entire defense of his own life, his philosophy at his trial in our next discussion. And then in the discussion after that, you'll see him having a real debate with somebody that he had a debate with, interestingly, right before his trial on the footsteps of the courthouse, right, with a priest, okay? On his way in to defend himself, Socrates had one of his classical philosophical dialogues with Euthyphro, and that's the name of that dialogue. 
So that's what we have in the next two videos. Socrates, I just introduced him. Next one, his whole life story, defends himself. And then the one after that, a sample of his philosophical discussions. Then after that, we'll go on to Plato. And then after Plato, Aristotle. Then we've got a few post-Socratics, as I like to call them, the Epicureans, the Stoics, the Cynics, the Neoplatonists, and even a little bit of the Christians. And then that'll be it for the Greco-Roman uh, philosophical era. <sighs> after that, Asian philosophy, India first, and then China. All right. I hope this was enjoyable. See you next time.